Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this analyst call for quarter three 2018 results of IMCDNV. At this moment, all participants are in listen-only mode. Following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. I would now like to hand the call over to Mr. Pete van der Slicken. Go ahead, please, sir. Good morning, everyone. I'm sitting here with Hans Koremans, and um, we are happy to answer your questions regarding our press release containing the first nine months 2018 results. These nine months results were strong, with operating EBITDA increasing with 26% to Euro 156.6 million, an increase of 32.8 million versus last year. All regions did very well, and we are particularly pleased with the strong organic growth shown everywhere. Obviously, this is the result of our strong business model, favorable economic circumstances, and relentless focus on execution of our model. As you know, we continue to focus on specialty chemicals and food ingredients and also keep investing in formulation expertise to help our customers to make products. In the United States, we are working hard to integrate ET Horn, which we acquired uh, at the end of July, and in Europe to do the same with Velox, which we acquired in September. Summarizing, we are positive about our business and are positive about the future. Um, as you know, we do not give uh, specific forecasts. Uh, and for the numbers, I now give Hans um, the time to give additional remarks. Thank you, Pete. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to give you a short summary of IMCD's first nine months result. I would like to start on page 9 of the presentation. We are happy to report a healthy 29% revenue increase and 30% increase in gross profit in the first nine months of this year. The gross profit increase was a combination of about 15%, one five, 15% organic growth and 15% as a result of the first time inclusion of acquired companies. Gross profit in percentage of revenue slightly improved from 22.5 to 22.7%. And this increase in percentage was a combination of product mix effects, changes in local market circumstances, the impact of currency changes, and, as usual, the first-time inclusion of acquisitions. Operating EBITDA increased 32% to the 157 million that Pete just mentioned, and this increase was a combination of substantial organic growth in all segments and first-time inclusion of acquisitions. The operating EBITDA margin increased from 8.8% in the first nine months of 2017 to 8.9% in the same period this year. The conversion mar margin, calculated as operating EBITDA in percentage of gross profit, so not EBITDA, but EBITDA in percentage of gross profit, of 39.3% was slightly higher than the same period of last year. On average, lower conversion margins in the Americas as a result of recent acquisitions, with on average lower conversion margins, were more than compensated by improved conversion margins in EMEA and Asia Pacific. And the net result before amortization and non-recurring items increased 33% to 109.2 million euro. Free cash flow and cash conversion ratio both decreased compared to the same period of last year. Substantial operating EBITDA growth in 2018 could not fully compensate the increase in working capital in the first nine months. And this working capital investment of about 50 million was mainly the logic result of substantial organic revenue growth in the first nine months of this year. And year-to-date cash earnings per share were €1.97, an increase of 28% compared to the same period of last year. And on the last line of this page, you could see an increase, an 11% increase in our number of employees. And the majority of this increase is the result of the first-time inclusion of acquisitions that we did. On the next page, slide 10, you will find gross profit, EBITDA, and conversion margin per operating segment. 
In the first column, you will find EMEA, and this segment reported 13% forex adjusted gross profit growth and 17% operating EBITDA growth. Operating EBITDA in percentage of revenue improved from 10.1% to 10.8%. And the acquisition impact in the first nine months in this segment is limited as it includes only the acquisition of Novendis in Italy in July last year. Velox, that we acquired in September, did not contribute to the result. So it's fair to say that most of the reported growth in this segment is organic growth. In the second column, the results of Americas. And in the first nine months of 2018, Americas more or less doubled gross profit and operating EBITDA. These growth figures include substantial double-digit organic growth. Further, the full-year impact of acquisitions made in 2017, mainly LV Lomas, and the acquisition of E.T. Horn end of July 2018 contributed to these numbers. Operating EBITDA and percentage of revenue and the conversion margin slightly decreased, as indicated in previous calls, mainly due to the first-time inclusion of acquired companies with relatively low EBITDA margins. Then Asia-Pacific in the third column reported 15% growth profit growth and 21% operating EBITDA growth. All growth was organic. Operating EBITDA in percentage of revenue and conversion margin further improved compared to the same period of last year. And then in the last column, you will find the cost of holding companies. And as you know, this includes all non-operating companies, including the head office in Rotterdam and the regional support offices in Singapore and New Jersey in the U.S. On the next page, page 11, you will find a summary of IMCD's free cash flow. Free cash flow and cash conversion ratio were both lower than the same period last year as a result of increased working capital investment. As mentioned before, this working capital investment is mainly the result of the reported revenue growth. CAPEX of about 2.5 million was mainly IT related. Page 12, short update on net debt and leverage. And compared to the end of September last year, net debt increased with about 113 million to 620 million. And this increase was a combination of, on the one hand, healthy operating cash flows, and on the other hand, substantial cash outflows as a result of acquisitions made and dividend payments. Reported leverage ratio, defined as net debt divided by operating EBITDA, including the full-year impact of acquisition made, was 2.9 times EBITDA at the end of September 2018. And then last but not least, on page 18, you will find our outlook for 2018, where you could read that we expect operating EBITDA growth in 2018. And that was a short summary of our year-to-date financials, and Peter and myself are now happy Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we're starting the question and answer session now. If you have a question or remark, please press star one now on your telephone. Star one for questions or remarks. Go ahead, please. Our first question is from Mr. Peter Olsen of Kepler Chevro. Go ahead, your line is open. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, three questions, uh, if I may. Uh, maybe to start with Asia Pacific, um, where in 2016-17 the operating EBITDA growth was, was lacking the gross profit growth. Uh, in, in 2018, uh, we see EBITDA growth exceeding uh, the gross profit growth. Uh, is it uh, fair to assume that in terms of investments, uh, you are now uh, largely done, and, and this is the kind of typical operating leverage that we su should see in this region? Um, or, or is there more to come in terms of uh, investments uh, going into 2019? Um, and, and then on headcount, uh, Hans, in the introduction, you, you indicated that most of the 11% increase in headcount is, is due to uh, the acquisitions. Uh, given the strong organic growth of the business, uh, do you see a need to, to add uh, people to, to support that growth? Uh, and then my last question is about the Americas. Um, could you shed some light on what you're seeing um, both in North America uh, and in Latin America 
uh, and to what extent uh, both sec uh, yeah, both parts of that region are, are contributing to the strong overall performance. Okay, um, maybe I take some of your questions. Um, Asia Pacific um, question whether or not we need more investments and investments in our business is investments in people, but also in um, uh, things like um, uh, labs, etc. I think I think you know we never done of course there with um, with investments, but I think that we have established now in um, uh, many uh, countries regions uh, a, a um, infrastructure uh, that works that generates income, and in that sense, I would say that we have now in the regions where we talked about before, like for example Japan gain the credibility uh, that uh, allows us to uh, leverage that cost structure more. So in that sense, we will continue to invest, but not at the same pace as we did before. Then you ask, um, do we need more people? Um, uh, that's, that's a bit of a generic question, I would say. Um, we look very closely always to ratios in terms of uh, productivity. Um, it is true that, for example, in the Americas, and particularly in North America, we need an infrastructure, management infrastructure, and we need to strengthen that further. Um, but I would say that we would not invest more people than, uh, you know, we um, uh, beyond what we feel is uh, is productive. So um, that's that's more business as usual. The final question was about the Americas and uh, was about what organic growth or a color bit of color about color. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. where there's a so, so what you're seeing in 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 North America and 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 in Brazil, whether there's a yeah you know, big differences yeah. or, or yeah. whether both are contributing to the growth. Yeah, but both are contributing. North America, uh, U.S., Canada. Uh, is doing uh, quite well, um, although of course we are still uh, very much in, 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 in further streamlining, uh, organizing it uh, better. Uh, it's still um, it's still doing uh, tremendously well. Um, Brazil consists, as as we discussed before, uh, about two major uh, business segments. One is uh, pharmaceuticals. The other one is uh, more industrial chemicals. Um, the pharmaceutical segment has done very well. Industrial segment has done uh, much better than in the past. Uh, there the remains work to be done, but both Brazil and the uh, North America have contributed to this result and the growth of this result. Okay, and, and, and the much better... Uh, performance of the industrial business in Brazil is that due to internal measures that that you have taken much much more than uh, improved market conditions. Uh, it's both because of course uh, we we went the last as you know the last two years through a very very deep economic slump in Brazil, uh, but also uh, um, uh, because of internal measures because of uh, ad additional business lines. That we were able to um, uh, to gain, so it's a uh, it's a mix of reasons. As you know, in Brazil, we all, always have a dependency on sharp currency fluctuations, uh, general econ economy. But I would say that let's say uh, various factors contributed to uh, to a positive development. Okay, thank you for the color. Next question is from Mr. Mutlu Gundogan of ABN AMRO. Go ahead, your line is open. Yes, uh, good morning, guys. Uh, a few questions. Uh, first, on the Americas, uh, if I look at your operating expenses, uh, they increased more than in the, the previous quarter in Q2, uh, while the increase in gross profit was roughly the, sa was roughly the same. Can you tell me uh, why that was? Um, are you investing more in the business uh, to accommodate for the high growth? Um, secondly, in Asia Pacific, can you tell me what is going on there? Because uh, your growth, gross profit is down 1% year on year, which is a significant deterioration 
from the high growth that we've seen in the previous quarters. And then uh, also on Asia-Pacific, uh, while gross profit was down, your operating expenses were up by uh, uh, 27%, if my, if my numbers are correct. And that's a significant acceleration. So uh, is, is that also because of investments? Uh, any color here would be appreciated. Thanks. Mutlo, Hans here. Um, I think first to start with your question about the Americas, whereby you said that OPEX went up substantially compared to margin growth. Um, I think that the reason for that is that what you see in the numbers is the entrance of EP1 accompanied with a much lower EBIT margin than the average of the group. Uh, and as a logic consequence, you see more OPEX than uh, the margin growth uh, as a contribution from, from ET Horn. The other thing that you typically see in the summer quarter is that uh, there is always a bit of what we call a summer dip, uh, whereby the cost structure stays more or less the same and the margin is always a bit lower than the, uh, the first six months of the year. But I think the biggest driver there is, uh, is, is ET Horn. Um, on Asia PEC, I, to be honest, I do not really follow your question there. Could you really explain? Yeah. So if I look at the um, if I look at the gross profit in Asia, uh, it was 52 million for the first nine months, um, and I think you did 35 in the uh, in the first half. So that means roughly 18 million. Uh, now, if I take out currencies and there was no impact from from M and A, that means that you're you're down one percent year in year versus the uh, uh, the sixty million that you reported last year. So, just I mean, I'm, obviously, I I have a few assumptions here and there, but is that correct that your gross profit is is maybe roughly flat or or down year in year? No, no, no. The gross profit uh, in Asia Pacific shows organic growth of 15% compared to last year, and in the last quarter, 17%. Right, right. Currency okay. adjusted. So, okay. so we saw a strengthening in uh, in the last quarter, uh, and operating EBITDA in that region increased 25% uh, compared to 19% in the first six months. Okay, okay. Then so we saw a bit the opposite of your remark. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, then... Obviously, I've done, I've done something wrong, so I'll, I'll, I'll check that. Uh, I have a few questions more, but I'll, I'll get back in line. Thanks. Was there another last? Was it la uh, last question? So, uh, so if this question is not correct, then probably the second one is also not correct. It's muted. Um, Mr. Tom Sykes of Deutsche Bank. Go ahead. <coughs> yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wondered if you could talk about how clients have reacted and suppliers have reacted to the network that you've built up in the Americas now, um, what conversations you're having with people about being able to take on larger contracts or regional business, um, and whether there's been any material change. I know it's early with regards to ET Horn. Um, I wondered as well whether you could talk about any integration milestones we should think about on the M&A side over the next 6 to 12 months that are particularly significant. Um, and indeed, when you look at the sales forces of the businesses you've acquired, do you think they're at the requisite levels to benefit from what might be some more cross-selling opportunities for you? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think very good questions. Um, I think um, generally my remark on the U.S. market is that we see, and I think also our suppliers see, the last few years accelerated maybe in, in, in this year, um, uh, a strong consolidation of uh, the chemical distribution market. And I think maybe to some a surprising strong consolidation. I, th I think we all know that uh, recently Univa announced that they um, will acquire Nexio, so more on the commodity front. We see, uh, of course, in the past uh, Azalis um, uh, acquiring businesses. We see the Maroon Group, another group that uh, tries to further consolidate. So um, the, 
that that means, of course, that also suppliers will have to look at how they um, <clears throat> use their sales channels in that market in the future. And uh, we have these conversations uh, with our suppliers, um, and I, I'm sure others have as well. Um, you will see some realignment of uh, supply relations in the future. How exactly, I can't say, I can't predict. But it's, 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 it's certain that in the American market we see consolidation going on and a, let's say a new view on how future sales channels should be in that market. As to um, integration, um, it's obvious that we have, have integration milestones and an integration plan, <clears throat> which is something that we will do um, diligently, but, uh, but, but also forcefully. Um, begins, of course, with, uh, with IT, uh, which is a very important element of our work. Um, it also um, has to focus on how to motivate, keep, and reward um, our people uh, and, uh, and also harmonize that. Um, it's, it's speaking with our suppliers and customers uh, what the best possible organization model will be. So, um, yes, in the next 6 to 12 months, you will see changes in the way we organized. Uh, but we, um, um, you know, we will do that diligently and uh, carefully. Um, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the end result will be a very strong marketing and sales organization uh, with a good physical distribution network across the region, uh, which, uh, which, is our, which is our aim. So changes in the U.S. market from, let's say, from, uh, beyond what, what, what IMCD is, uh, and um, the market is adapting to that. And we, we play, of course, in specialties a leading role in that. Okay, so we, we thank you for that. Um, we, we should expect, I guess, therefore, some larger scale contract uh, bidding, effectively, in, in in the U.S. over the the foreseeable future. Because it sounds like they're going to consolidate contracts, or um, is, is, is that what you're alluding to? And uh, and then I guess in terms of the remuneration of employees, are there any particularly marked differences? in the acquisitions and is there anything that could cause a problem in terms of how the acquired companies are remunerating their employees compared to how you've historically remunerated them? On, on your first question, I would say uh, um, that when we, when we, our strategy is to build a national model that we of course also would like to uh, uh, have um, national alignments, if possible, or strong, uh, large regional alignments. Bidding is, of course, something that doesn't happen, but um, um, conversations and, and uh, uh, discussions with our suppliers take place. But I, I'm sure that uh, our competitors do the same. So uh, that, that is a continuing process. As to as to remuneration, of course there are always differences between companies, but we are we are pretty confident that we can, you know, uh, have a model that is satisfactory to uh, to all of uh, all of our people in uh, in the U.S. So I'm not I'm not so concerned about that. Okay, I'll leave it there. Many thanks indeed. The next question is from Mr. Rajesh Kumar of HSBC. Go ahead, your line is open. Oh, hi. Good morning, gents. Uh, thanks for taking the questions. Uh, just following up on uh, the client and supplier discussions regarding expansion into North America, uh, do you think that you have also found some new supplier opportunities with the new North American presence, which you may be able to take to Europe? And then from your experience in such negotiations, how long does it take to cross-sell to suppliers uh, across different markets? 
Uh, that's the first question. Uh, the second one is uh, if you could give us some color on where you're seeing uh, certain vo good volume growth momentum by sector, uh, say pharma, food, etc. If, if we could have some color on that, that would be quite helpful. And uh, finally, in terms of uh, if you look at the leading indicator for bulk chemicals, they all seem to be in very good momentum. Historically, speciality has lagged. Do, do you expect to see um, continued organic growth momentum? I know you don't give guidance, but in terms of uh, the kind of volume trend from the exit rates you have, uh, that, that would really help. Okay, uh, on your first question, um, I think I think throughout our history, our model has been, of course, to um, and, and uh, to to bring relationships that we have uh, to other regions where we uh, uh, could could also work for them. And it's it's very difficult to give you a a rule of thumb how long that will take. It's pretty sure, of course, that in in doing these acquisitions in North America, that we will have um, various discussions, and we also have. Let's not forget, we also will have situations where some suppliers will say, um, maybe this is maybe you're not the right partner for us for various reasons. But of course, our goal and our expectation is that uh, that uh, that we will grow our business. Uh, overall, by leveraging the relations that we had already, so uh, for us, of course, it's a, a senior management. It's a continuous uh, conversation among ourselves with our suppliers um, to um, to to align, to invest in that relation, to invest in um, our formulation expertise for these specific uh, suppliers. And um, it's very it's very difficult to to let's say give you some sort of um, guidance or time scale uh, on that. But it is certain, of course, that suppliers that we meet and know in the North American market um, that we also see them back in Europe or in Asia and vice versa. Um, on uh, volume growth per sector. I would say that overall we see good growth in uh, the various se segments that we are working in, um, both in the industrial sectors like uh, like like coatings and construction and um, uh, plastics, but also in our life science, food, pharma, and personal care. Very good growth, um, and um, I would not pick one segment that really stands out on that. Volume trends versus bulk chemicals. I, I, you know, maybe I'm too long in the business, but I've stopped trying to understand these relationships exactly. Um, um, if somebody can tell me exactly what the correlation is, uh, let me know. But I think, uh, I think, you know, we, we we continue to work very very hard on adding. Uh, product lines to our business, and the problem with our business is, of course, not it's not only um, volume growth, but it is also adding new lines, um, uh, increasing the added value that we do for our customers and our uh, suppliers. So um, I, I can't I cannot give you any guidance on future volume trends. Just to know, uh, that's very clear. Thank you very much. Just uh, one technical one. Uh, did you have to apply hyperinflationary accounting in Argentina, or is that still accounted on the old basis? Sorry, I missed your question here. Uh, uh, Evan, do you have any hyperinflationary accounting application? No, 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 we don't have that. No. 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 Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Natalie De Brown, the Grove Peter Cam. Go ahead, your line is open. 
Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I will stick to the uh, Americas, actually. Um, um, well, you, you flagged the, uh, the consolidation that is ongoing in the region um, and that the, fact, the, the fact that it's accelerate, accelerating, and we, we also see that. So I was wondering, uh, you already made two acquisitions in the region over the past year. I was wondering, in the short term, how much do you feel that you can still take on and integrate efficiently uh, in order to, um, well, effectively expand your presence in the country and, and uh, f afterwards leverage on, the, on your suppliers' relations? So the question is, is more, do, do you feel that there is some pressure for you to make acquisitions there? Uh, and how much do you think that you can still take in the coming year? Okay. Well, we try to, um, to, to take away as much pressure as possible on, on ourselves. So um, we don't feel that pressure. What we, what, we, what we want to do is, as you know, we have done in the last few years uh, three, three significant acquisitions and two um, just uh, pretty recently in, in, with Lomas and with E.T. Horn. And it's very important for us to... Um, to integrate that now, um, I do not rule out that we will do other acquisitions, um, but there's no pressure and also not an immediate necessity. It's, of course, something that is not totally determined by us. It's also the market, it's owners uh, that, that want to sell. Um, we will always, uh, as we always have done also in Europe, continue to be vigilant and, and uh, eager. Uh, but we don't feel any pressure uh, at this moment. Okay, and to, to, to follow up on that, uh, given that indeed that market is consolidating, do you see actually uh, an increase in uh, price paid, so in terms of multiple over there? Um, yeah. it, I, I think generally maybe in the market, in the last one or two years, you see a little bit of an uptick. In, in it's a bit uh, not only in the in, in the U.S. but generally uh, because of the good economy, you see some some increase of of multiple. But um, still, still in our view, within our let's say um, means. Uh, so I would say yes, a bit, um, but that's a general remark. I would say it's not only for the U.S. Mm, okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, and perhaps then if I can uh, have a bit more uh, color on the organic growth that you see uh, in the region, uh, you flagged that substantial double-digit organic growth there. So I assume that is the reason why the margins uh, at EBITDA level stayed more or less stable to the 8% while you are integrating these lower margin companies. Can you uh, perhaps elaborate a bit on what the drivers uh, are behind that solid organic growth? Is there any specific segment that stands out or something that is temporary and that should fade out later on? Or well, no, can, no, uh, no, nothing is forever, of course, as you know. <laughs> But um, uh, I think that we also benefit very much from a good economy in the in the region. We, we, as I said before, in Brazil, we uh, we, we really have a, a strong year. Um, it is um, um, uh, the the fruit of uh, hard work over the last couple of years, where we were much more, let's say, um, flattish, uh, adding product lines. And I wouldn't say it's in one particular segment. It's uh, it's 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 uh, across the board. Um, so I would say favorable markets, favorable economy, uh, plus a strong, as I said before, strong model uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, gives us the opportunity to capture these uh, favorable wins. But uh, as we all know, um, I mean. Um, you know, nothing is forever. Things change, but uh, we we still feel very uh, positive about uh, about the future. All right, thank you. That's it for me. The next question is from Mr. Rajav Bardalai of XMBMP Paribas. Go ahead. Your line is open. 
Hi, morning. I uh, just have two quick ones uh, remaining. Um, just on current trading, could I just touch on that topic again? Because, you know, obviously some chemical companies have talked about demand conditions softening in October specifically. And I appreciate your end market exposure is different versus them, but just wanted to confirm that you, know, you haven't seen any notable change in momentum, you know, in recent weeks since the end of the third quarter. And then secondly, just wanted to touch on transport and freight costs. I know this kind of comes up now and then, and you've said in the past that there's no major pressure, but could you just confirm, uh, you know, in North America specifically as well, are you feeling uh, or experiencing any untoward pressure on that side of things? Thanks. <clears throat> on the on the first question, uh, I would say that we that we still uh, uh, in the third quarter saw um, yeah a, a positive trend in in demand. Uh, there are of course uh, let's say f how do you say that uh, frictions between s the months, but generally in the quarter um, we saw demand still strong. On freight costs, um, yes, you're right. Uh, we see in particular in um, North America, um, uh, a, an increase in freight costs, uh, which is triggered, as, as, as we have noted, uh, on the one hand, because of the very, very good economy in that region, but also because of the more stricter enforcement of, um, of, of uh, labor laws, which requires uh, drivers to uh, stick to these rules, whereby the capacity them uh, lessons. We have never had uh, issues in um, passing on increased pricing uh, to our to our uh, customers, and we will continue diligently and uh, forcefully to do that. So um, it is it is sometimes a let's say a challenge for our logistic people, but um, uh, we don't feel that that is a an impediment for 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 growth of our business. Okay, very clear. Thanks. Our next question is for Mr. Davis Peace of Goldman Sachs. Go ahead, your line is open. Yes, uh, hello, good morning. It's actually Mattia Gergole from Goldman Sachs. Um, three questions from uh, from my side. Um, first one is just on the conversion margin in uh, in North America, a little bit not following up from the previous questions. I mean, you, you made the point clear that there's a bit of a decline because of, say, the integration of the new acquisitions. Could you give us a bit of, say, color? Where do you see the conversion margins on a, say, comparable basis? I'm just trying to understand if there is some cost pressure building up in America. I don't know are you actually, how successful you are in passing that through uh, to final customers. Secondly, you know, cost pressure seems to have become very, very topical for distributors. Um, if you look at your different markets, not just North America, but maybe also you know, Germany, the Netherlands, are you no. Know, is there any concern in your mind about some of these costs building up, whether there's no energy, logistics, wages? Um, you just mentioned you, you're typically able to pass it on, but is there anything this time that might be different or more extreme compared to the past? And then third question, just on the organic growth. I don't know how much you, you, you're willing say, to elaborate, but clearly you know, double-digit organic growth is, um, is, 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 is very strong, uh, probably much better than what we thought uh, one or two years ago you could, you could deliver. How long can this type of say growth rates uh, say be sustained, or you know, is this like a period in IMCD history that is uh, you no, know, at the end of the day, really unusual? Thank you very much. Maybe the first question for you all. Yeah, and, and that was your question about the conversion margin and, uh, and passing on price increases to the market. If, 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 if you look at we we bought. LV Lomas and E.T. Horn, two companies with an EBIT margin of around about 4%, and as a consequence, pretty low conversion margins. And so when we acquired these companies, we already announced to the market that you could expect a substantial drop in the, uh, in the overall conversion margin in the region. But when you look now year to date uh, at, at our, uh, the first nine months of this year, then what you can see is that the gross margin in this region holds up to close to 20%, whereas it was last year, uh, which means two things. That's on the one hand that the acquired businesses in the end more or less run now on the same average gross margin percentage, so you, there you don't see a dip, and that we at the same time are in a position to pass on price increases to the market. 
Um, the, 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 I missed your second. Question. No, I will take. I will take that one. I think. I think this is about cost pressures. Um, yes. And and uh, and that's a very good question also because, and I said it. I said it many times also in the past. Um, that say our capital, of course, uh, are our people, and um, uh, people that have um, technical commercial skills, and that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's a rare commodity, so to say. It's um, it's it's. Um, I think everybody in our industry will, will confirm this. It's uh, not easy uh, to uh, recruit these people. Um, there's a lot of demands for these people, so a lot of competition, and that has, of course, an upward pressure on costs. Um, that's that's clear. Uh, that's not new, by the way. That is something that we that we have throughout our. Uh, uh, business life, uh, but it is uh, it is a, it, it is a very important factor. Um, I, I would say freight is, and and, and that means also that um, uh, to to elaborate on that is that we have to be very diligent in our recruitment policy, uh, but also uh, keep a, a very close eye on our productivity. So the the ratios are key. Freight costs, I, we mentioned, I think that that is, a, um, of course, is an issue, but it's something that we, that we have well under control. Again, um, part of our success is, um, or a large part of our success is, is based on the quality of our people. Um, and, um, yeah, these people, of course, also expect uh, a career, but also uh, a good compensation package. Then your last question was on uh, uh, double organic growth. Um, I think that if anybody, any CEO would tell you, maybe with the exception of those who are in um, Silicon Valley companies, that we would every, every year grow double digits, you should not take serious. So I'm, I'm, it, is a, it is a it's a very good performance. Um, we are not going to promise double-digit growth every year. We will do our best. Um, we are very, very, let's say, focused on, on growth, on organic growth. Um, but our history also demonstrates that we didn't have that every year. So continue to work hard on it. We have now an exceptional year. Let's see what the next year brings. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Mr. Hank Veerman of Kempen & Co. Go ahead, your line is open. Hi, team. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Um, there's actually only one left remaining. I think it's a topic already discussed uh, uh, a bit. But it's it's actually on your organic growth uh, on your on your organic growth in the U.S. I think if I do the numbers, I sort of get an implied organic. Uh, growth in the U.S. of of about 20, 25, 26 percent, and obviously, I mean, there's there's sizable contribution from synergies uh, from your acquisitions in there, and that may that 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 gets me the question uh, gets me to the question um, when you look at, when you look at your echo, echo, the, at the acquisition of E.T. Horn and and you and you compare it with the acquisition of L.V. Lomas, is it fair to say that? Um, your expectation on the sales or on the gross profit synergies uh, of, of, of LV Lomas, are they, in terms of percentage of GP when you acquired it, are they, are they more or less similar? In other words, should we, in, into 2019, when the synergies of ET Horn kick in, should we sort of expect the same or at least like also a significant contribution from, the, from those synergies of ET Horn? Mm. <laughs> so that's a difficult question, uh, Hank. Um, yeah. Listen, I think I think maybe the best answer is 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 that we that that we want to bring our business to the level that let's say that you see today, um, uh, or or improve it further, and that means, of course, that we need significant synergies. 
from our Amer from our West Coast business. Um, but if it's equal to uh, LV Lomas, Hans, I I don't think we can we can say anything about that. I don't even know exactly what the numbers are on that. But uh, so so I would I would expect that we will we will work very hard to create. Um, a situation whereby we, uh, you know, the revenue of of the business that we bought is as productive as it is in our other businesses. Uh, and and then the options that we have, Hank, is on, is on the one hand increase gross margin in that business. The other thing that we could do is leverage supplier relations, so do more business through the same structure, or make the organization more cost efficient. And we try to turn all three wheels, and let's see what comes out. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Next question is from Mr. Kreerijn Mulder of ING. Go ahead, your line is open. Yeah, Kreerijn Mulder from ING, two questions from my side. Uh, with regard to the acquisitive par uh, growth in the US, can you give maybe a somewhat split, uh, somewhat in percent between Horn and uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, Lomas, uh, given the fact that Lomas was acquired last year, I think in September, or is that, uh, or that's, that's my first question. And the second was, the question is about the cash flow. Um, if I recalculate the second, the third quarter against uh, the first half year, um, your cash flow was something like 55 million, if I'm correct. And that compares to something like uh, 53 million euros in, uh, in uh, operating MBDA. And that means, in my view, that your cash conversion is already 100%, or even more than that. Uh, in spite of the fact that the growth of revenues was still 28% uh, in growth margin of a growth profit was still 28% uh, the same level as the second quarter, for example. So maybe you can explain to me um, what happens with the working capital um, in the third quarter, because in my view the working capital was quite stable in that uh, in that period. Yeah, I create an answer. Perhaps to first answer your last question, what what, what we typically saw is we uh, the, the growth rate in the third quarter was more or less the same as in the second quarter, so, so double-digit growth there. And what you then see is that the investment in working capital, mainly driven by higher debtor positions, if you then still grow the same level, you stay at the same debtor level and you don't need to invest further. So most of the pain was in the first half of the year and your your, your math was right. We slightly reduced in the uh, in the third quarter. Um, so let's see what that brings towards year end. I hope, by the way, that we also have to report a lower conversion ratio by year end, because that would mean that we still grow significantly compared to last year. Uh, then, then on the acquisition growth, um, I, I think what we announced to the market is the timing of the acquisition and the uh, the revenue that we bought and. So what we see is uh, uh, last year we indeed acquired Lomas in September, 1st of September, so there we have eight months of acquisition growth and one month like for like. And ET Horn is, uh, I always need to remember when we exactly closed it, but I think it was two. Yeah. Uh, it was just one month of sales in, in the numbers that you see. 31st July. So it's two months then, yeah. two months of sales in the in the year today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, okay, so we can take. If you then do the math, yeah, if you then do the math, you will see substantial organic growth of the uh, of the existing business. Okay, thank you. The next question is from the line of Miss Elenia Balbor of APG Asset Management. Go ahead, your line is open. Yeah. Hi. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for t taking my questions. My first question is uh, in terms of your uh, debt position. Uh, you are reporting $620 million at the end of the, of the quarter. So if my calculation is correct, that means that you have a utilization in your revolver of north of $200 million. So I understand there's some working capital investments there, but uh, my first question would be, are you considering to come to the market to, to, to finance um, uh, that, that amount, or are you happy with the, you're comfortable with that utilization in your revolver? 
And my second question would be uh, if you could uh, tell me what's the expected 12-month uh, EVDA contribution of your last two acquisitions, the Horn and Bellocks, please. And my third question actually would be if um, you are considering to, uh, to get a, a rating, a credit rating. Thank you. The, the utilization of the, of the revolver, uh, I think what you know is that we have a uh, revolver facility of about 400 million. Uh, if, if your math is right, that would mean that we have uh, substantial room to further maneuver. Um, with respect to the, uh, to the acquired EBDA, uh, I would like to refer to the two press releases that we sent out indicating the EBDA that we bought. And that's also what we use in the, uh, in the leverage calculations. Uh, and we, are, we have, at the moment, no intention to get a rating for our loans. And we, we issued a new bond, uh, our first bond in the, uh, in the first quarter, the second quarter of this year, without a rating, unsecured. Uh, and the placing was very successful, uh, and we have the feeling that we can save us the cost of, uh, of getting a rating. Thank you. We have another question from the line of Mr. Mutlu Gundogan of ABN AMRO. Go ahead, your line is open. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, a few more questions. Um, first, on, on current trading, uh, I, I think, Pete, you said it several times. Just wondering, because, I mean, yesterday one of your peers reported uh, horrible results. We've seen various chemical companies uh, be very cautious towards the end of the year. Just wondering... If that is uh, if that is more the cyclical part of the business, i.e., uh, do you think that you, as a distributor of specialty chemicals, are shielded from destocking, or would the impact have, do you expect the impact to be less or to be later? So that's that's the first question. Um, yeah. Uh, no, well, first of all, last quarter, of course, is, is I mean, generally, so nothing to do with is always a bit is always a bit softer because of the December month, but um, and I but I have no indication that uh, that will be um, uh, that the trend that we now see is uh, is very different in the last quarter from what we have seen uh, up till now. Um, uh, you know, I said before how long this will. Uh, we are not shielded. I mean, we are not totally shielded from anything. Um, because if the demand falls out, we also, of course, know that. Although, of course, we have uh, a very resilient business model, being in various markets, uh, regional, but also in terms of, uh, of um, uh, you know, the different markets that we work in, in food and in personal care and in construction, etc. As you know, we... We're very strict in not trying to uh, figure out how the future uh, looks like, uh, so I don't want to do that now. Um, I cannot um, comment on what happened to uh, one of our competitors, but uh, uh, all situations are different, and uh, uh, as I said before, we still look positive to the immediate future. Yeah. No, I mean, the question was more theoretic, so to say. I mean, I can understand that people would de in commodity chemicals, as that usually is the bigger part of, let's say, the bill, whereas specialty chemicals are usually smaller in volumes and therefore also smaller in terms of the price you pay. So just wonder if you had some general remarks on that. Uh, but that, that's okay. I mean, uh, maybe a second smaller question. Um, do you know what the direct or indirect exposure is of IMCD towards the auto sector? Mm. That's a good question. Um, it is, uh, of course, in the markets of coatings and plastics, uh, we are exposed uh, indirectly yeah. because we, we don't directly deliver to the car industry, but through uh, their, um, uh, let's say, the, the companies that deliver to that, we deliver to. So there is a connection. How how big that connection is, I don't know. I can't say. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then um, on on EMEA, uh, there have been outages, uh, supply disruptions because of the low level of the Rhine. Uh, 
Have you seen any impact because of that, be it positive or negative? No, we, we haven't. But what we see uh, generally is because of the fact that economies are doing well that we uh, have seen shortages in uh, uh, certain uh, uh, raw materials. So uh, that's more a general remark, but not so much because of, let's say, weather-related circumstances. Yeah. Uh, okay, just, just two more small questions. Um, on LV Lomas, um, I mean, have, I'm to be a little surprised to see that your conversion margin is already at this high level uh, uh, despite the dilutive ex effect. So just wondering, is, is that business now, so to say, at par, or still is there room to improve on that business? There is still room to improve. There's always room to improve, Mortal. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's, it is, it is uh, of course, we have done a lot of work there, uh, still a lot of work to do. Um, uh, we lowered the cost base of the company. Uh, I think we improved management, uh, but there's still, uh, there's still work to do. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of, have you, I assume you have done you've done the, 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 the low hanging fruit, so to say, so maybe more on the cost side. So when you say more, more to do, is that more on the, on the cross selling side or is there still room uh, more to do on the cost side? Yeah, I would say both, but it's, uh, it's uh, uh, very important for us of, uh, as well as, of course, is to add business to our also to, to our Canadian business or product lines, and that's uh, something we are working on. So uh, both, I would say, more efficient in the way we work, but also, um, you know, take care of, pro uh, of uh, margin growth, percentage margin growth, and top line growth. And then uh, final question, uh, apologies for the long list, um, any, and those are not extraordinary expenses, but maybe should we, should we expect higher expenses for personnel because you, you have, you've had such a good year, um, I would assume that you also have higher bonus payments. So would that, could that could have a negative impact on Q4 compared to last year? Yeah, that should not have a specific impact on Q4 only, because what we do is we accrue bonus provisions during the year. So right. when we see an improvement in results, we already start accruing uh, additional bonuses. Okay, that's very helpful, Hans. Thank you. Okay, thank you, guys. We have another question from Mr. Rajesh Kumar, HSBC. Go ahead, your line is open. Uh, hi, good morning, Jeff. Um, not to stress the point, just because there's so much interest on the freight cost impact. Could you quickly r remind us how much of the freight or logistics do you self-deliver versus outsource? Yeah, if, if, if you look at our P&L, uh, what you see then is that Part of the freight cost, uh, basically the inbound freight as we call it, so the cost to get the good in the warehouse is past part of our cost of goods, mm -hmm. uh, and that should then end up in our gross profit. And the other, other part is reflected as third-party cost. And what you see there is that on average we pay roughly, out of the top of my head, around about 3% of our revenue to third-party cost, and that is partly freight, partly warehousing and partly warehousing services. And that even in North America is outsourced? Also in North America, we outsource logistics wherever we can. Okay, understood. Uh, that's very clear. And just uh, on the Argentina growth, uh, I appreciate a small part of your American business but uh, I noticed that uh, if you calculate organic growth for North America, or for Americas, it, it can be skewed by Argentinian exposure. Can you confirm, excluding Argentina, you had a, a basically double-digit organic growth in Americas, please? I guess you mean Brazil, because Brazil is the, uh, is the big... Uh the big business. Yeah, basically, wherever you see currently devaluations, both Brazil and Argentina. Uh, you refer now to Argentina, but Argentina is for us very small. Very, very small. Okay. Okay. 
So the, the majority of the business in Latin America and South America is in Brazil. And when I say the majority, it's uh, 99% or 95%, something like that. So don't worry about high inflation in Argentina. <laughs> I now understand the question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any further questions or remarks, you can still press star 1 on your telephone. Star 1 for further questions or remarks. Go ahead. Okay. Gentlemen, there are no further questions coming through. Please continue. Yeah, that, that concludes, the, I would say, the, the call. Ladies and gentlemen, Hello? this concludes this conference. Thank you for attending. You may disconnect your line now.